Segment 3A, Introduction. In this fine lecture, 13 British colonies appear up and down the Atlantic coast, south of Canada. Although each of the colonies was founded for a unique reason, the colonists were united by their status as British subjects, or as they would tell you, second-class British subjects. Not every American colonist was upset by living under British rule, but the majority of them did support the American Revolution when the time came. Upon winning its independence, the new nation formed by these 13 colonies achieved its own revolutionary form of democratic government, the great experiment known as the United States of America. Segment 3B, The Thirteen Colonies, discusses the founding of the British colonies and examines some of the reasons why people emigrated there. The Virginia colony was the first of the southern colonies and possessed the plantation culture typical for the South, with its definite upper and lower classes. The Massachusetts colony was founded by pilgrims who had left for religious reasons and its organization typified New England. Merchants and independent farmers of roughly equal status, devoted to their own religious beliefs, but not particularly tolerant of others' religious beliefs. In between, colonies such as New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Delaware were more open to settlers of diverse beliefs and diverse backgrounds. The first step in knitting these colonies together was the French and Indian War of 1756 to 1763. Although the colonials, as I'll call them, did more than their share of fighting against the French and the Indians on Britain's behalf, they got very few of the benefits. In segment 3C, Revolution in the Air, we encountered the concept of taxation without representation. The colonials weren't totally against paying taxes to the British Empire. They thought, though, that paying taxes should entitle them to direct representation in Parliament. Britain was not about to let the tail wag the dog. The British, as a result, tried various economic measures to put those colonials in their place, but the colonials would not stay down. Pressure groups, such as the Sons of Liberty, helped to unify the colonials against the British. The shooting war finally started in April 1755. The Continental Congress did an admirable job of running the rebellion through the Supreme Military Commander, General George Washington. Yet the odds were stacked against the ragtag Continental Army. Were it not from the help of nations from, such as France, which was always looking for a way to stick it to the British, our revolution might well have been lost. Ultimate victory of the, over the British, recognized by the 1783 Treaty of Paris, granted the colonials their independence. But now that the war was over, the toughest task lay ahead. In segment 3D, building on our beginnings, the former colonists invent a government for their new nation. Drawing upon the philosophy of the Enlightenment and the writings of the classical Greeks and Romans, the Constitutional Convention got busy. The process took time, but the convention worked out a document which carefully balanced state and federal interests. It also established an equally careful balance between the legislative, judicial, and executive branches of government. With very little modification and only moderate haggling, the new constitution was approved by all 13 states. George Washington was the first president. Resisting pressure to declare himself king or declare himself dictator, Washington proved to be an excellent choice. While he was not the most intellectually gifted of the founders, 
He enjoyed tremendous prestige, and his good common sense helped keep the new nation on an even keel. Segment 3B, the 13 colonies, the British and North America. The inhabitants of Great Britain's American colonies were a unique lot from the start. They reached a new world from various locations for various reasons, most of which involved freedom of worship. While the Spanish and French colonies in North America never attracted many Spanish or French settlers, Britons and other Europeans came to the British colonies in droves. Upon becoming residents of the New World, these colonists thought of themselves first as members of their colony, and only then as subjects of the King of England. The two earliest, and therefore the two most prominent, British colonies were founded in Virginia and in Massachusetts. Virginia goes back to the abortive Roanoke Colony, 1586 to 1587, of Sir Walter Raleigh, which had been chartered and established for the purpose of exploiting its natural wealth, such as its natural wealth turned out to be. There was no gold in the Roanoke Colony, only malaria and angry Indians. The Jamestown Colony of 1607 was more reality-based, and it proved more successful, but not immediately. Seeking to avoid conflict with the Spanish, who had been established in that part of the world for some time, the Jamestown colonists settled roughly 35 miles up the James River from the bay. Like the Roanoke colonists, the Jamestown colonists were more interested in finding gold and getting rich than they were in farming. This made it hard for the colony to become self-sufficient and fight off Indian attacks. Fortunately for Virginia's economy, a new strain of tobacco was discovered in 1612, which became eventually the colony's prime source of revenue. Although Virginian soil was now profitable thanks to tobacco, the colony itself struggled. In 1642, it came under the control of the royal crown. The class structure in Virginia, as in most of the southern colonies, tended to reflect the sharply defined upper and lower classes found in Great Britain. Small farmers were few and far between, compared with the plantations owned by the wealthy and worked by the lower classes, or sometimes by African slaves. One famous product of this Virginia plantation gentry was America's first president, George Washington. Massachusetts got off to a somewhat different start. After 13 years in Dutch exile, a group of Puritans set out for Virginia on board the Mayflower. In autumn 1620, they instead reached Cape Cod. They believed that residents in the New World had removed them from the com command of Great Britain and of all European powers. With this in mind, the Pilgrims drafted the Mayflower Compact, a formal agreement to abide by just and equal laws drafted by elected leaders. Such a thing would never have happened in the thinly settled French or Spanish territories where the king's rule was law. However, because they were British, because the British had a tradition of parliamentary democracy, the Mayflower Compact made sense. In December, the Mayflower reached Plymouth Rock, and the Pilgrims began building their settlement. That winter, nearly half the colonists died of exposure and disease. Neighboring Indians, such as the famous Squanto, saved the Pilgrims by showing them how to raise corn. The Indians would eventually come to regret their good deed. In 1630, more immigrants arrived on Massachusetts Bay, 
They had a grant from King Charles I to establish a colony. Their leader, John Winthrop, openly set out to create a quote-unquote city upon a hill. In effect, a place where Puritans could live in accordance with their religious beliefs. Because they had their own charter from the king, they believed authority over their colony was not in Great Britain, but in Massachusetts itself. This in turn provoked some new ideas about self-government. The charter granted all power in this colony to the general court, which was made up of men belonging to the Puritan church. This guaranteed the Puritans would dominate the colony, not only in religious matters, but politically. Most of New England was run along the same lines as Massachusetts. Although the theocracy, that is to say government subject to religious beliefs, was not quite as pronounced as it was in Massachusetts. The Puritans' theocratic tendencies weren't for everyone, though. Free-thinking types rebelled. In 1636, Roger Williams bought land from the Indians on what is now the site of Providence, Rhode Island. There, he set up the first American colony to practice open and total separation of church and state, and the first to offer complete freedom of religion. A fellow dissident preacher, Anne Hutchinson, took advantage of this haven, although she was later killed by Indians in New York. Freedom of religious worship was also a main concern in the central seaboard colonies of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware. There, even publicly scorned denominations such as Quakers and Roman Catholics were made to feel welcome as were Jews from all around Europe. Indeed, the colonies on the central Atlantic coast became considered the most cosmopolitan, wedged in as they were between the diligent and devout small farming Puritans of New England and the plantation culture of the southern colonies. The cities of Philadelphia and New York, formerly New Amsterdam, took their places alongside Boston as the colony's leading cities. The French and Indian War the French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763, is thought of in Europe as part of the massive Seven Years' War. That doesn't concern us here. To the British colonists, it was a grim struggle against the French army and its Indian allies. In 1752, the French wanted to drive the British out of the Ohio River Valley without a war, if possible. They hoped that building two French forts at strategic locations would scare the British out. In response, <clears throat> the governor of Virginia, which claimed much of the Ohio Territory, sent a young colonel, George Washington, with a letter requesting that the French remove their forts. When the French refused, Washington started building a fort himself, Fort Prince George. It is on the site of the modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But before Washington could finish building his fort, the French took it, finished it, and named it Fort Duquesne. In 1754, the British sent an expeditionary force to take Fort Duquesne back. Washington was second in command because he was a mere colonial. Washington's part of the force skirmished with the French near Great Meadows, Pennsylvania, and on July 4, 1754, they were forced to surrender. The French and Indian War had begun. The French had large forces of well-trained regular soldiers scattered throughout their New World territories. Since the English could spare only a few regular troops, the colonists wound up doing more than their share of the fighting. In 
On February 10, 1763, the Seven Years' War was ended by the Treaty of Paris. In the New World, France gave up all of Canada to the British, and they gave up the Louisiana Territory to Spain. The British also got Florida from the Spanish. Great Britain won the war hands down, but the colonists had nothing to show for the important role they played. Instead, they got more British troops shipped in in order to quote-unquote protect them from the nasty Indians. To help pay for this unwanted security, the British raised taxes upon the colonists. The colonists had lived in 13 separate colonies, but the anger against the British for raising taxes started to be build a common continental or colonial or American point of view. In 50 years' time, the French and English settlers of the Ohio River Valley, who had been fighting each other in the war, would all be Americans and proud of it. The British would be all gone. Segment 3C, Revolution in the Air. When the French and Indian War ended in 1763, the big winner was Great Britain. The French had been kicked entirely out of North America, and the Spanish were pushed back behind the Mississippi River. But now Britain had problems with their own colonists. The colonists had done more than their share of the fighting in the French and Indian War, and they, had felt, they felt that they had earned more of a say in their government. They didn't appreciate the extra taxes. Several of these colonies claimed territory all the way through to the Mississippi River. They wanted these claims recognized. The British, however, didn't want their colonists doing any freelance colonizing. In 1763, the British gave out a royal proclamation which tried to retain control over the interior of North America. According to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, colonists were forbidden to settle in Florida or any lands between the Allegheny Mountains and the Mississippi River. Supposedly, this was to give the Indians a fair shot at making their own lives. In practice, it had to do with the British wanting to maintain control. But the colonies were growing and thriving, and so were their populations. The colonies needed more territory. This would become a common theme in American history. The Royal Pro Proclamation of 1763 was largely ignored because the British just couldn't afford to enforce it. Taxation without representation. History teaches us that maintaining an empire is expensive. In the long run, it's usually too expensive. The British wanted their colonies to be self-supporting and to pay for their own defense. One result was the Sugar Act of 1764, which levied moderate taxes on imports of sugar. To the colonists, though, it was the first instance of taxation without representation, and it was a first step toward revolution. Another economy measure was Great Britain's Quartering Act of 1765, which required the colonists to provide professional British soldiers with free room and board. Worst was the Stamp Act of 1765. This forced the purchase of revenue stamps to be placed on all types of publications and legal documents. Joining various secret organizations like the Sons of Liberty, colonials broke into customs houses and destroyed all the hated stamps they could find. A Stamp Act Congress attended that summer by representatives from nine colonies declared the Stamp Act and other stamp such activities unconstitutional. <laughs> 
The British did indeed back off for a while, and then they turned up the pressure. In 1767, the Townsend Acts placed duties on many British goods imported by colonists. The colonists were not impressed by British excuses for hitting them in the wallet. England had enjoyed parliamentary democracy for five centuries by this point, but Englishmen who happened to live in the Americas were getting the shaft. If the colonials were to be taxed like Englishmen, they wanted to be represented like Englishmen by sending their own members to the House of Commons in London. The British argue that the House of Commons and Parliament as a whole represented the British homeland and the colonies alike. The Declaratory Act of 1766 stated that, Brit that Parliament represented the entire British world. The American colonists again disagreed. To enforce the Townshend Acts, Britain next stationed two regiments of regular soldiers in Boston. On March 5, 1770, a simple snowball fight ended with the deaths of three people in the so-called Boston Massacre. In 1773, Britain granted the East India Company a monopoly on tea sales to North America. This cut colonial businessmen out of the most lucrative trade in the British Empire. Opium hadn't been discovered yet. The colonial business community was thus driven solidly into the camp of wild-eyed revolutionaries like the Sons of Liberty and radicals like Samuel Adams. On December 16, 1773, Adams and his cohorts turned Boston Harbor into one big teapot. Americans are taught to revere the Boston Tea Party as a brave and noble act. But to the British, the Boston Tea Party was an act of terrorism. Boorish colonials destroying property that wasn't even theirs. Parliament therefore passed the so-called Intolerable Acts of 1774, that's an American term for them, obviously, which closed the port of Boston, forced Massachusetts to feed and house British troops for free, and destroyed elective government in Massachusetts. They were trying to teach Boston a lesson, but in so doing, the British only won the other American colonies over to Massachusetts's side. On September 5, 1774, the First Continental Congress met in Philadelphia. The delegates didn't want to alienate Britain further, but they just refused to obey the intolerable acts. The First Continental Congress stated that colonists were, in, were entitled to life, liberty, and property, and that taxes should be determined by colonial legislatures, as along with other such matters. The intolerable acts effectively forced the colonies to con ask themselves a question. What are American colonial rights? A few colonists were still in favor of negotiating with Britain over what these rights would be. But neither King George III or Parliament was interested in further dialogue. In spring 1775, British troops were sent to confiscate some munitions which were heard to be at Concord, Massachusetts. On April 19, 1775, a group of militiamen called the Minutemen intercepted the British at Lexington and fired, among other shots, the one heard round the world. On May 15, 1775, the Second Continental Congress met at Philadelphia and declared itself at war with Great Britain. Colonel George Washington of Virginia was named commander of the American forces. The revolution was underway. The odds against the Continentals' success, they call themselves the Continentals, 
was astronomical, or were they? Another year later, the Continental Congress adopted a resolution calling for separation from Great Britain for good. A group of five delegates, headed by Thomas Jefferson, composed the official Declaration of Independence. Adopted on July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence justified the founding of a new nation by an appeal to the natural rights of humankind. And I quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. The French had been following developments in the British colonies. They were delighted, understandably, by the birth of this new nation in North America. French intellectuals were thrilled by the slap in the face to an entrenched monarchy, take that. The entrenched French monarchy was thrilled by the opportunity to play catch up with Great Britain. Already, France was sending su supplies to the American revolutionaries. American envoy Benjamin Franklin played upon these feelings to obtain, in 1778, a treaty of alliance, friendship, and commerce between America and France. Shortly after that, Britain declared war on France. In 1779, Spain considered supporting the Americans against the British. The Spanish hated the British, too. But they declined out of fear for their North American empire. Finally, the British declared war on the Netherlands in 1780 because the Dutch continued to trade with the Americans. Harassed in North America by rebellious colonials and French expeditionaries, threatened in Europe by a French-Spanish-Dutch alliance, the British were struggling against great odds. The Americans had started the American Revolution as underdogs, but over time European political entanglements helped give the Continentals a fighting chance. Segment 3D, Building on Our Beginnings. Anuit Coeptis. On October 19, 1781, the main British army in North America surrendered to the Americans at Yorktown. The Redcoats were well trained and well equipped. So were the mercenaries the British hired to help fight the Americans. But the Redcoats and the mercenaries were no match for the ragged Continentals who were fighting on their home soil amidst their families for a clear principle, a nation which would ensure them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Early in 1782, Britain initiated peace talks. On September 3, 1783, America and Great Britain signed the Treaty of Paris, acknowledging the independence, sovereignty, and freedom of the 13 former colonies, now the 13 states. The new nation's boundaries were Canada, Florida, which had been given back to Spain, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Mississippi River. On June 20, 1782, Congress approved the Great Seal of the United States. Included on the new nation's Great Seal was the Latin motto, 
annuit coeptis. He, she, it, whatever, has approved of our efforts. This was done to acknowledge the new nation's blessed start. Unlike the English language, which requires that a subject or subject pronoun be used for every verb, I have approved, you have approved, he, she, it has approved, we have approved, Latin does not. A Latin speaker would not be bothered by a verb appearing without a subject. A Latin speaker would assume that the subject of the verb adnuit would be God, Providence, Lady Luck, or what have you. How you or I choose to fill in the blank for the subject of annuit correctis was left open. It ultimately depends on one's personal belief system. The Great Seal's designer, Charles Thompson, explained his work in these words, quote, The pyramid signifies strength and duration. The I over it and the motto allude to the many signal interpositions of providence in favor of the American cause. There are many complicated interpretations of these symbols on the Great Seal. They don't concern us here because it tends more toward the argument of religion and society, religion and the state in the United States. It's simplest to say for our purposes that the Americans were deeply and rightly aware of how surprising their victory had been. And they felt very grateful, whoever they were grateful to. They certainly wanted to build upon their nation's beginnings as best they could. But could the new nation come up with an effective government which reflected its lofty ideals? The Articles of Confederation were adopted by the Continental Congress in 1777. They came into effect in 1781. They strongly favored states' rights, as one might expect from colonies which had revolted against a strong central government. Yet, a strong central government was necessary for many reasons, especially for internal settlement and for conducting foreign affairs. Winning the revolution was quite an achievement, but this was neither the first nor the last revolution to be won by a determined splinter group. A tougher task lay ahead, and an even greater miracle was to take place. The creation of the United States of America. Most issues before the Constitutional Convention could be settled through common sense. Paper money would be issued, a post office established, and an army and navy maintained. Less sensibly, Women were granted no citizenship rights, which was unbelievably unfair. There were other problematic issues. Large and heavily populated states like Virginia argued for proportional representation. The bigger you were, the more representation you got. Smaller states wanted equal representation. Finally, it was decided to have proportional representation in the lower House of Congress, the House of Representatives, and equal representation for each state in the senior house, the Senate. Nice job, guys. Another issue concerns slavery. Representatives of northern states wanted slaves counted as equal to free people for purposes of determining every state's tax burden. That would cost the South a great deal of money. They did not want slaves at all to count at all toward determining a state's number of seats in the House of Representatives. That is to say, they wanted to have it both ways. Ultimately, the founders agreed that for tax levies and House membership, a slave would count as three-fifths, that is to say, 60% of a free person. 
That's sad. Worse yet, there was no discussion of the institution of slavery itself. This omission nearly destroyed the United States before it had a chance to become a century old. Significantly, the Constitutional Convention established a unique and complicated balance of powers between the executive, legislative, and judiciary branches. The plan for the United States government was truly a work of art. But how well would it work? President Washington and Foreign Entanglements On March 4, 1789, the United States government officially took power. There was really only one candidate for president, George Washington. Some Americans wanted to name Washington King, or name him Dictator. But to his eternal credit, George Washington had said farewell to kings. Unanimously selected by the Electoral College, Washington was inaugurated as president on April 30th, 1789. In 1792, he was unanimously awarded a second term. Although Washington's only work experience was as a surveyor, planter, and army officer, his wise leadership contributed greatly to the new country's success. He organized a national government. He developed policies for settlement of territory held by Britain and Spain at one time, and he stabilized America's northwestern frontier, otherwise known as the Northwest Territory. He presided over the admission to the Union on completely equal terms of three new states, Vermont, 1791, Kentucky, 1792, and Tennessee, 1796. Finally, in his farewell address, Washington demonstrated great diplomatic insight by advising that the United States, quote, steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, end quote. Washington's experience in the Seven Years' War, which was fought on North American soil because of the disagreements of European powers, had soured him on getting involved with the Europeans. The French Revolution of 1789 presented Washington with a dilemma. America owed a great debt of gratitude to King Louis XVI, for his personal support. Yet American sympathy lay strictly with the revolutionaries. Wisely, the United States maintained strict neutrality. Although Washington never spoke the precise words avoid foreign entanglements, so often attributed to him, examination of his printed farewell address shows that the phrase, well, explains his approach. Yet Washington realized also that America could not just stick its head in the sand. For one thing, the United States had borders with British colonies in Canada, French colony in Louisiana, and Spanish colonies, Florida and Mexico. Overseas issues also proved troublesome. Dealings with the Barbary pirates of North Africa caused the United States, even during Washington's presidency, to pay tribute. Later, the United States had to negotiate for hostages, create a standing navy, and fight wars with Tripoli in 1801 and Algiers in 1815. Increasing friction with Great Britain over mostly commercial matters brought on the War of 1812. Yet overall, Washington practiced what he had preached. In 1793, he himself gave up the 1778 Treaty with France because he thought America was not strong enough to side with France 
against Britain, Spain, and Holland. He was right. Although this decision was hardly worthy of a Virginia gentleman, it was a wise and necessary step for an American president to take. America is very fortunate that in this and in other matters, George Washington could tell the difference. Segment 3E, Conclusions. One, out of many, one. Given the diversity of the 13 colonies' governments and the diversity of the people who lived there, the creation of the United States was truly a miracle. The northern and southern colonies were almost separate countries in their attitudes, and they would turn out to be separate countries before the next century was over. Not everyone in the colonies sided with the Continentals. Great Britain's universally shoddy treatment of the colonists after the French and Indian War helped unify the colonies, as did the wise leadership of the delegates each colony sent to the Continental Congress. But perhaps there was also a sort of will to self-rule born into those who made the decision to come here to the New World. In their sons and daughters who were actually born in the colonies, it became the American will to self-rule. Two, <clears throat> the Sons of Liberty. The colonial movement called the Sons of Liberty wouldn't qualify as terrorists by modern definitions. Springing up in Boston and New York to protest the 1765 Stamp Act, they caused more nuisance than they did physical harm. But the British, no doubt, would beg to differ. The Sons of Liberty specialized in vandalism and in tarring and feathering British loyalists, which means you basically pour hot tar over somebody and cover them in feathers. Will it kill you? No. Does it make you happy? Doubtful. And as the movement spread through the colonies, more violence sometimes ensued. Even after the Stamp Act was repealed, the movement remained as a network for those who wanted to end British control over the colonies. Leading members of the Sons of Liberty went on to further premeditated offenses against Britain. One was Samuel Adams, now a beer, but back then the inventor of the Boston Tea Party. Whether they were truly terrorists or not depends on one's point of view, but they were certainly effective and they certainly didn't play by the rules. Three, thank you, France. And I mean it, thank you, France. Had it not been for French assistance, it's likely the American Revolution would have failed. Individual Frenchmen, such as the Marquis de Lafayette, supported the Americans from the start. But in 1778, King Louis XVI of France made French support official. Not that he was acting out of altruism. He didn't really care to be a nice guy. Had he known that the guillotine was 15 years away from him, he may not have done it at all. But in politics, the enemy of your enemy is automatically your friend. And like any good French king, Louis XVI hated Great Britain. France had nothing to show after the 1783 Treaty of Paris, except for a pile of debt, which would later on help contribute to the French Revolution. In fact, in 1799, the United States backed out of its mutual defense treaty with France, primarily because France was so outgunned by its enemies. We weren't all that grateful back in the day. Four, our first president, had the British been a little smarter and a little less conceited, they might have avoided the American Revolution entirely. They might have learned from the Roman Empire's experience that foreign-born Romans were a source of desperately needed fresh blood. Instead, the British were fixated on denying American-born Englishmen a place in British public life. George Washington's greatest dream in life was a commission 
as an officer in the regular British Army. His service in the French and Indian War proved Washington clearly worthy. Instead, Washington's status, experience, and personal charisma earned him con command of the Continental Army and ultimately made him America's first president. Washington was not the deepest thinker among America's founders. He was not a very skillful general or a very dazzling orator. Yet he was so much more than the sum of his separate parts, and Americans looked naturally to him in times of crisis, and he came through. It's a shame Americans today, myself included, do not appreciate our first president, George Washington, more than we do.